it's so hard to tell people what to look for when you're horse shopping because the training and the past experiences make all the difference in the world. Hey there, welcome to another episode of the Willing Equine Podcast. I'll be recording this episode in my car, so the audio may not be super clear, and sometimes I have my kids with me, so if you hear a little bit from them, I apologize, but hopefully you can still enjoy the podcast. I'd love to hear from you after you listen to the podcast, so feel free to comment on any of my social media platforms or email me or even send me an anchor voice message. Hi, in episode nine, you had great ideas for how to keep your horse and things you can benefit from um, when you keep your horse and things you can learn. What would you tell somebody who is now looking for their first horse, Um, like the top three things that you'd want somebody to know? Okay, so what a fantastic question and also a very complicated one. Um, I think a lot of times the temptation is when we're looking for horses is to look at the size, the color, you know, what's the discipline, can they show, can they do what it is that I want them to do, but I think the really the most important question is, are you able to provide an adequate life for horses and keep your horse in an environment that is conducive to the species that will be appropriate for them and will encourage a general um, sense of well-being and provide them their immediate needs. So we're going to need um, the ability to move. So to roam, we're going to need a larger area. Sometimes you can do this with like a, a paddock paradise setup or um, a pasture type setup where there's lots of variable terrain and different types of grasses. We don't want just a solid, rich Uh, kind of grass designed for cattle. We don't want that either. Uh, Maybe sandy areas and some water and all these different things. So, and I know a lot of people are restricted in this because they board their horses, which is fine. Just try and find something as close as possible to this ideal that you can find for your horse that will help them to maintain a happy and healthy lifestyle. We're also going to need to be able to, you're also going to be able to need to be able to offer companionship so will the horse be able to have buddies and uh, other horses in the pasture with them that's really important Uh, shelter is um, a necessary uh, thing for horses so the availability to go in and out of shelter as needed for um, for when the weather gets bad and I try not to use my preference is not to have restricted Um, stalling so technically in my setup because I do have a setup that was built that I'm using I did not build it myself um, and so I'm just doing the best I can with what I've got there to come in from the pastures for bad weather they do have to go to stalls but the stalls have very large walkouts which really helps Um, and I almost never close them up into the actual stall unless the weather is so extreme that it's a uh, risk to have them outside and that rarely if ever happens. I think I've done that one time and it was because there was tornado warnings um, and hail. So uh, so having access to shelter that the horse can choose to go in and out of as needed would be ideal. And then obviously being able to feed them appropriately. So having forage available 24-7. So even if they are in a stalled environment like at a boarding facility um, or there's times when they are going to be in the barn or in a restricted area, maybe there's not enough grass for everybody, there should be other forage available. So hay and slow feeder nets, enrichment activities, and so on. So we want to look at the environment that we're going to be able to keep the horse in. And that's the first question. That's the first recommendation I have for people. If you can't provide the horse with the the necessary environment for them, then we're going to run into problems later on. And even in the training, we'll run into problems. We'll run into health problems, um, behavioral issues, and training issues. So that's the first is we got to look at the environment. We got to look at the lifestyle we're expecting this horse to be able to, um, to live in and be able to provide something that is adequate for the species first. And that's the very first, um, tip I have for them. The top, if I'm going to look at my top three, my very first top tip is can you honestly, genuinely provide what the horse needs first? The next 
tip I have for people, the next recommendation is um, to be prepared for the fact that horses are large animals and that they require training. Uh, even when people get even smaller animals, it doesn't even have to do with how large the animal is. Um, when uh, when I have puppy owners, because I used to train professionally dogs, um, I used to train dogs for professionally too. I would always, when people would ask me what they should, what they should be prepared for, and what they should look for when getting a dog, is, is I would tell them, "Are you prepared to spend money to hire a trainer, somebody to help you?" Even if it, that means like signing up for a training course or taking periodic lessons or going to puppy classes um, and with horses, this is going to translate over to um, signing up for a training course, maybe an online video library, taking private lessons, um, doing group classes, tr- paying for a trainer to work with your horse, even hiring a behaviorist if something severe shows up. Um, you know, that's that's a really important part. So on top of the normal medical care, the the farrier, all of that, this is something that people need to ask themselves is, should I be getting a horse um, with the understanding that is highly likely and highly probable and even not just, I mean, it's necessary to have somebody helping you and assisting you and training you and your horse. So um, that's something else that I recommend to people is that they're prepared for that. So on top of the care bills and the medical bills and just the general all of that that goes with it with horses we've got this training aspect that goes into it Uh, so especially even better would be to have somebody already in mind that you plan to work with if something were to show up or just from the get-go probably best best case scenario is that you would have a trainer already lined up that you want to work with right away so no nothing kind of sneaks into the training that you weren't anticipating um, and you guys build from the very very beginning a really healthy relationship so that's going to be one of my top recommendations as well Um, and then you know once we've gotten past the okay can you actually afford a horse are you prepared to take care of the horse properly uh, and can you afford training because that is absolutely something that's going to show up Um, another aspect into the same kind of category would be the tack and equipment Um, a lot of horses need custom saddles and really honestly uh, short of just kind of getting (laughs) lucky Um, most horses it takes a long time to find a saddle that properly fits them and especially if you're trying to do it without a custom you don't have to have the saddle custom made but having it custom fit so a lot of English saddles you can have like Reese flocked or stuffed or um, and shaped according to your horse you know make little changes with western saddles this is near impossible Um, Usually you have to just change saddles. Uh, Thankfully, Western saddles seem to resell fairly, you know, fairly okay. Um, But this is absolutely something that goes into it. Can you pay for the tack, too? And And good tack, not just little you know, cheap, you know, my cousin told me this would fit my horse tack. Not that, you know, maybe your cousin's a custom saddle fitter and then go with that. But you know what I mean? So be cautious of that just trying to say you're just going to pick out a saddle you know um a saddle really can make or break what's going on in the training and your horse's health and general well-being uh in tack in general so bits and bridles as well um bitless is even if they're not fitting right it's a problem so be prepared for all of that as well and finally my final piece of advice and the biggest one and this is the one we'll spend the most time talking about um and I'm trying to figure out exactly how to explain this in a way that will transfer over to people in a way that you can take it with you horse shopping and looking for horses I guess this is kind of a multi I'm just gonna I'm gonna categorize this these pieces of advice so we've got the general welfare and caring for the horse and how they're kept and then we've got the the money spending part the training and the tack and the equipment and now we've got the actual the relationship aspect I'm gonna put it that way so when we're looking for horses when we're looking for a horse that's gonna be our family member that's gonna be our um, our companion and our partner and a horse that we're going to spend a long time with um, that's 
not going to be disposable, you know, it's not going to be, I'm going to buy this horse if it doesn't work out, just change him out. If we're not shopping with that frame of mind, if we're shopping with long-term goals here, which I would hope that most all of my listeners are, um, then we actually need to be paying far more attention to the individual horse's personality and the way they're responding to things and the way they're acting more so than what they actually know. So you can, I have enough experience now that I'm able to, I can watch videos and I can see horses do, you know, performing and, you know, doing their sale ads and I can watch and I can see a shut down horse. I can see a horse that's been suppressed and, um, punished into, um, obedience, blind obedience. And you know, actually a prime example of this is I was looking for a pony that, um, I'd like to bring, I wanted to bring into the family, uh, for my kids particularly, but for me as well. And I was pony shopping for a very long time. And I was, it was heartbreaking because I kept seeing all these cute, adorable ponies, you know, who can resist a little pony. They're so cute. Um, And I'm watching these videos and these ponies, you know, they have kids on them and, oh, this is child safe and wouldn't harm a fly and perfect, does everything, rideable, you know, whatever. And of course they're priced at ridiculous prices. But, um, and I was also looking at rescue horses. That was high on the priorities. I really wanted to rescue one. Um, I just happened to get sucked into looking at sale ads as well because who can resist? Um, but you know, these, these ponies, and this happens with horses too. I I can see that they're, yes, they're walk, trot, cantering with this kid, but this kid is like slamming around on the back and like yanking on the reins. And this pony is just like, please get off of me. Like just so miserable looking. And I think everybody else sees these videos and sees a well-trained horse and they see a horse that understands its job and is taking care of these kids. And they're like, yes, great. That's what I want. But for me, I see a horse that has been pressured and punished into blind obedience and has been taught that there's no escape, so they should do what they're told. And the problem with this, the big problem with this, is that when you stop punishing and pressuring the animal into this blind obedience, when you stop pushing them into learned helplessness and um, being shut down, when you stop suppressing the behaviors and you start training with a more uh, patient and kind approach and when you start letting the horse have you know choice in the training and start to speak as far you know quote unquote speak about what's going on and how they're feeling there is often a really big letdown of what's actually happening And what I mean by that is there's this like unpacking of baggage where you, you know, after a certain amount of time, it could be a couple days, it could be months. Um, I've seen it take a long time where all of a sudden it's like the horse just throws up all their baggage on you. They say, oh, you're not going to punish and pressure me anymore. Here you go. Here's all my fear, my anxiety, my stress, my worry, my problems you know, here, here you go. And sometimes it happens slowly, you know, a little bit at a time, problem behavior starts showing up. And sometimes it happens seemingly overnight. And you just go from this seemingly perfect little pony to a demon, you know, it's like, what just happened? It's like, anyway, it's intense and it's crazy. And what's sad is that's, that's the real horse. That's the real horse that just has been so shut down and so suppressed that nobody's ever met the real horse. And this is the real horse. And so what can happen when we're horse shopping and looking at horses for rescue and adoption is we see these horses that are performing the behaviors and doing beautifully. Um, And then when they're no longer worried about being punished and they don't feel as threatened or worried about being forced into doing things, we start to meet the real horse. We start to, they, everything starts to unravel. They start to show behaviors that weren't there before. They start to change and suddenly they won't do certain things that we thought they knew how to do. And they won't, um, 
they start lashing out and start acting dangerous and all of a sudden you have this horse that you didn't buy um and sometimes also personality starts to change too so and this usually happens after that huge letdown and then there's this recovery period and you're working through it uh, i have horses that when i originally bought them they were energetic and very sensitive and really almost reactive to things um, and there was it was all about keeping them calm and um, and they were just always very very responsive and i really enjoyed that and liked that but once I started kind of unpacking baggage and getting to know the real horse um, and started showing them that it was okay, that they didn't need to worry and stress around me. Um, I started to realize that the horse that I thought was a really energetic horse, that they had a lot of energy, that they were um, energy users. They were just, just had a lot to, you know, they just were go, go, go all the time. They were actually so so wound up and so tight and tense that they were constantly on edge and they were constantly looking to just, they were always in like a borderline flight mode all the time. But then when I unpacked everything and then helped them feel comfortable and confident, they suddenly became a very low energy horse and very comfortable and they didn't feel like they were on edge all the time and ready to explode. Um, so I actually went from a horse that was ready to just tear around the arena and which I actually really enjoy high energy sensitive horses um, to a horse that was like I'd rather just stand here thank you very much this would be awesome thank you for letting me just stand here and not scaring the living daylights out of me um, this is wonderful and beautiful thank you and that's fantastic I'm so happy that I've been able to allow that horse to feel at ease and and quiet and not so on edge all the time but my point in the story was is that when you're dealing with looking for horses to add to your family um, sometimes the horse that you see when you're shopping is not the real horse and this is really complicated and difficult to explain to people um, and it's why I think a lot of you know potential horse owners and then eventually you know, horse owners that get down the road a little while with their horse, things start fall, seemingly falling apart and they don't understand why. And so they'll send it back to the original owner, they'll sell the horse, or they'll see if the trainer can fix it. Because the horse has not been adequately, um, the, <laughs> the urgency the horse felt to respond and to behave and, and to all that suppression that was happening is no longer existent because the owner is either more passive or doesn't is not consistent with their use of pressure or punishment um, and so things start to unravel and they don't know what to do because that's not the horse they bought and can you please fix this horse um, I come from a little bit different perspective as far as I do want the horse to unravel. I want them to completely let go of all that past trauma all I want them to not be afraid of me and not want to or not be worried that they're going to be punished so I want all of that unraveling to happen so I can meet the real horse um, but that takes time and can be nerve-wracking for people and hard to make the horse shopping experience a honest one because you're not always seeing the real horse so it's hard to it's hard to look it's hard because you're looking for your your forever companion but who is this horse that you're looking at in front of you is this horse really the horse right now that you're seeing or is this this some sort of different horse that will be different you know this horse will change in three four five six months to a year um, it's hard to know sometimes so with all that being said then where does that leave us you know how can we possibly go out looking for a horse um, and come home with the horse that we were hoping to be getting the answer is is that I can't guarantee anybody anything uh, I you won't be able to, no trainer will be able to guarantee you anything and um, but my recommendations are one to work with a professional that you trust and that knows what it is that you're looking for and knows you and knows your personality type and um, knows you know if you're 
a person that gets overwhelmed quickly by a horse that's high high energy and highly active and just offering behaviors and really intense. If you get overwhelmed by something like that, then you're going to need to look for a particular type personality horse. And, um, or if you're like me, where horses that move slowly, that chew slowly, that think slowly, uh, and are calculated in their movements and what is it that I'm supposed to do next, Um, and very patient and quiet horses, if that's what gets you irritated, then, you know, then that's something to take into consideration too. Um, I work really, really well with very intense horses, horses that think quickly, that move quickly, that are very sensitive and are going to push me to be an excellent trainer, that are going to react fast and be thinking fast that's, I, I do really well with that, but that's not to say that I can't work with another type of horse. That's just, that's my personal preference. So, um, but as a trainer, I've learned to work with every type of horse and I just adjust accordingly. But if you're looking for just your one horse, this, you know, you want to kind of look for something that's going to suit your personality type. Um, there are certain students that I have that can't necessarily work with certain ones of my horses, certain, certain horses that I have, um, because, the horse would overwhelm the students and that would be counterproductive and frustrating to everybody. So we don't want to do that. Um, and then, so anyway, and then there are horses and people that get along beautifully, just their personalities match up. Everything's fantastic. So having somebody in that knows you, that understands you, even if maybe it's a a spouse or um, a friend that knows horses really well, that kind of knows your type of training that you do, um, that knows what it is you're looking for then that would be somebody excellent to take with you and and to look at horses with you, whether it's looking at foster horses or horses for adoption um, or if you're actually looking to buy a horse. So any, you know, somebody who is very realistic, that's emotionally removed from the situation, so it's not a horse that they're getting and they know you very well, uh, would be a great person to take with shopping with you. Um, And take your time, take lots and lots of time, be patient, be, um, have your goals in mind and have your, uh, have what you're looking for in mind and try not to get swayed by pretty colors and pretty, you know, this pretty manes, um, pretty faces, you know, just be very, you know what you're looking for and stick to it because, the last thing we want is for you to get a horse and then realize six months down the road that you made a mistake and then have to rehome that horse because that's counterproductive as well. Uh, it doesn't help the horse at all and it doesn't help you and it's stressful and emotional for everybody. So we want to avoid that. Now, as far as looking for a horse that's going to suit you personality-wise, yes, you want a horse that, well, it really depends. So if you you're going to be working with positive reinforcement. It really honestly doesn't matter too much what the horse already knows because you're likely going to retrain most of it. Um, (laughs) Just being brutally honest there, you know, a lot of that's going to disappear when you start training, changing the motivators that you're using for chain training uh, and you're gonna have to retrain some of it. It may come back quickly because they already know a lot of it, but I'm personally not too worried about the specifics of what the horse knows. Actually, in fact, it's probably better if the horse knows nothing. Um, that way I'm not having to do a lot of retraining. I'm doing a lot of fresh training, and, but that's, that's me, you know. So we're gonna have to look at you and what it is that you need and want. You might just want some basic behavior so that you know you can walk the horse in and out of the pasture, um, but you don't necessarily need them to know how to be ridden or know how to jump three feet or whatever it is. Uh, If you do have very specific goals, though, maybe you want to compete in a discipline uh, and you do plan on maybe using a little bit of positive reinforcement, but you're still thinking, I'm going to ride primarily with negative reinforcement and I do want the horse to know some because I'm not a trainer and I want to have a basic foundation there. Perfect. Great. Either way, though, I think that you should spend time getting to know the horse outside of being ridden, outside of training. You know, watch the horse in the pasture, interacting with the other horses. Spend time with the horse in protected contact. So you're on the outside of the fence. The horse is on the inside of the fence. Um, 
don't have food with you necessarily, just kind of watch them, see if they come up to you and how they interact with you, um, see if they're social or not, are they, um, I, there's just, it, by watching and observing a horse, you can learn a lot. You can observe a lot by watching them interact with other people. Is the horse very, you know, when they're being led from the pasture into the barn, do they look like they've resigned themselves? Or is their ears back and they're kind of just like moseying along and tagging behind the person on a loose lead, but they're like barely coming along? Like that's, that kind of tells you something. Um, are when they're being ridden around are they very push button do they do everything that they're told exactly how they're told without any emotion that's telling to me honestly I want my horses to have some emotion I want them to tell me what's going on I want them to be enthusiastic I don't want them to be resigned to their you know (laughs) to their fate um or are they the opposite are they so overly like their inner their ears are straight forward their heads up high they're kind of seemingly on edge all the time that's that tells you something too and that's also a big warning uh red flag that something is wrong that they're very stressed about their um their environment and the training and everything like that so that's that's a bit of a tell as well we want our horse to be engaged and seemingly very um calm and relaxed about the training, but also willing and um, peaceful about it and not so resigned or, or really intense. We don't want to see things like bucking after fences and, um, you know, rushing to fences or hanging their mouth open or grinding their teeth or ears flat back or tail swishing. That's another big one. You don't, you don't want to watch uh, see a lot of tail swishing. Actually, probably my biggest recommendation to people is to buy the book, um, let's see, it's called language signs and calming signals of horses or language, something like that. I will link it in the show notes, but, um, that book will help you out a lot. You'll be able to understand horse behavior more, uh, better than you ever have and you'll be able to see what the horse is communicating is the horse telling us that something's wrong or are they happy and content um there's a lot to be just by watching and observing what's going on in the horse will tell you a lot of what's to come in the future as far as your relationship goes and um you know i it's hard for me to communicate you know, just over a podcast or even over a video, the feeling of what a, a horse on edge feels like and versus a horse that is just has more energy and enthusiasm. And a horse that's on edge, that energy is coming from a very different place. And that horse may not genetically be a high energy horse and you may find yourself when they're more relaxed and not um, feeling like their life is (laughs) hanging on the line uh, during training that they're a little bit more peaceful and they're a little bit more mellow and calm and relaxed if you can just get them to settle but it's hard for me to explain that that comes a lot from experience this is when working with a professional or somebody that understands the difference is going to be of great help to anybody um and the there's also a difference between a horse that is um, really shut down and resistant and just like, don't touch me, don't make me move. And they fight back and they fight against, you know, the leg squeeze. They fight against being pressured into something. Um, but they're actually, funny enough a fairly high energy horse. So I actually have a mare like this pumpkin for you guys who follow me on social media. She is, when I first got her was seemingly just this low energy, you know, kick to go or push or whatever, squeeze to go, whatever you had to push and push and push and prod to get her to go, which seemed perfect at the time because I was buying her so that my very novice husband and father could ride. And I was like, good. If they have to kick perfect. So that's at least she won't bolt or take off on them. You know, like that's the better, 
better option for them. Um, but what's funny is, is when I started unpacking everything later and started redoing her training, oh my gosh, that horse is so much fun. She is so much fun. She is so sensitive and has so much energy and she loves to play and will just bolt around the arena and has just so much enthusiasm for life and is so energetic and just, I can't even explain my students that get to know her really well and get to see her raw, like see her when there's not pressure and see her, you know, now versus before they're like, what do you mean you used to have to kick her to make her go? Like, what do you mean she used to be low energy? And it was a, it's a total transformation. If you saw her two, three years ago, you'd just be like, this is not the same horse. There's no way this is the same horse. Um, so this is, this is what I'm talking about is that a lot of times the training has such a huge impact on how the horse acts at the time. And so it's so hard to tell people what to look for when you're horse shopping because the training and the past experiences make all the difference in the world. You change that. You change their experiences. You change their understanding of training. You change how they interact with people. And their personality can change. Their their interactions with people, their energy levels will be like, you have a totally different animal now. Um, and it's exciting and it's so much fun. Uh, but it's, it's challenging when you're horse shopping. So, um, so yeah, so just to bring this all back around and I know this is super unhelpful. (laughs) It seems like it's very unhelpful for somebody who's looking for a horse and wants some clean cut answers that I don't have and I can't give you is just get to know the horse and be prepared for the fact that there's going to be some stuff that gets revealed, I should say, that, you know, the horse you're seeing right now when you're horse shopping is not necessarily the horse you're going to end up with, especially if you plan on changing how that horse is being trained, um, because that makes a massive impact. So try and look for personality, watch for for the behavior, the calming signals, the the langu- the body language, how the horse is telling you they're feeling about the training, and that will tell you a lot. It'll tell you a lot about what's to come and what's going to change. Watch them in a natural environment where people aren't interfering. Watch them. You could even if the if the owners or or whoever will who has the horse will let you try and teach them something new, like do some target training with them or spend some time with them doing some positive reinforcement or something different and see how they respond to something new, something that is done in protected contact. So there's no threat of being punished and see what happens. Do they, do they seem to kind of like wake up? Like, are they like, Oh, this is awesome. Or do they start to like, they, they wake up a little bit and they start to go, oh, I can breathe. And they start relaxing, you know, so start watching for those behavioral changes and see what happens. Um, and it's not an exact science, so I'm not going to promise anything, but hopefully this will give you some ideas and some stuff to look for and give you, um, I don't know, just a general, general comfort in the fact that, well, I guess it's not really comforting, but hopefully comforting. <laughs> Maybe it'll just better prepare you. It'll better prepare you for, you know, that things may change. That it's just because the horse was one way one day doesn't mean that's how they're going to be forever, which is both a good thing and can be frightening and scary for some people. So just be prepared for that and be prepared to take care of the horse properly and have help um, from trainers and uh, during the shopping process and after and look for a support group for your type of training. Uh, some of people that are like-minded that can really help you and support you and encourage you in your future relationship with your horse. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. On there, I have a really extensive blog. I'm a very prolific writer. And I also have a an FAQ page. And the FAQ has all kinds of things. It has questions and answers about training and about my training specifically, as well as just general about working with positive reinforcement. There's also sections on there about health and um, behavior. So all of that. 
I'm also on a lot of different social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So check those out. And I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to email or send me a message. Thank you.